Today I thought we'd look at a proposed clock circuit that I alluded to in a previous video. And particularly I thought we'd have a look at what it does, why it doesn't work, and what we might do about it. So what I was aiming to achieve here was a signal that was high for one quarter of the time and low for the other three quarters. So we wanted to have something that was going to do this, and then be low for something like that. Obviously that's not to scale. So in reality we actually wanted two of these signals and we wanted a particular timing relationship between them. But let's ignore the finer details and just look at the fundamentals. So our 4047 clock chip has two kinds of outputs. It has the oscillator output and it has the main output and it's an inverted counterpart. So these run at half the frequency of that. So, it seems like a really good idea to simply use an AND gate to combine the two together. So that when the half frequency clock is high, we're going to see the pulse from there. And when it's low, we're not going to see it because both of those are not true. Output's going to be low. Everything's sweet. And if you build that, it almost works. So there's the output of our clock circuit as originally designed, and you can see that the basic shape is reasonable, but something's not right. And you can tell something's not right because it keeps sinking to something other than the leading edge. And if you look closely, you'll see these glitches occasionally appear. Now, if we shorten that time base, we should make that a bit more obvious. So here we've halved the time base down to 50 microseconds per division and that makes it a little bit clearer. Uh, the glitches do pop up a bit more frequently, not always hidden. Unfortunately our trigger level is a little low and so we're triggering on the glitch. Perhaps we'll see whether we can get that trigger level just high enough so that we only trigger on the actual desired waveform. Okay, so that's a little clearer now. Now we've, we've raised that trigger level to four volts, and now we're only triggering on the waveform we actually want. That's interesting though, because that shows just how high those glitches are getting, and the extent to which they could be causing us problems. So what we'll do is we'll adjust the time base some more, and we'll introduce some delay so we can see that glitch on its own. Okay, so we've changed the time base to 100 nanoseconds per division and we've introduced a time delay of about 220 odd microseconds. So that means we can see just the glitch. And as we can see, it's rising to probably even actually above 4 volts. It's a wonder we don't trigger on it, to be honest. Um, and the duration is, well, it's what at least 200 nanoseconds, maybe, uh, maybe a, a whisker more. So why does it glitch like that? Fundamentally the problem is that our oscillator out is slightly ahead of our main output. Now it's one of those things where if we'd have done this ourselves, if we'd have had a clock and our own flip-flop and we divided the clock down in an external flip-flop, we kind of would have realized that it's going to take some time for that flip-flop to change state. When it's all in the one package like this, it's very easy to just think that it's all going to work together nicely. But that's not necessarily the case. So our issue is that we have maybe 200 nanoseconds or so of extra propagation delay on the main output relative to the oscillator output. So what we're trying to do is suppress every second pulse from oscillator out here. And we're relying on the fact that on every second pulse that this output will be low, the condition of our AND gate will not be satisfied, and our output will be low. Great, except that that flip-flop takes time to change state. And so we see the oscillator out go high momentarily before our Q output goes low, and therein lay the problem. So one of the things that we could do to try and make this better would be to try and introduce an extra propagation delay here between oscillator out and our 
AND gate. Now, it's a quad AND gate. We're only using, well, we're only using one of them in our little test circuit. Obviously, we need two for, to build this thing here. But right now, we're just using the one. So we've got three extras going wanting. And that's kind of handy, because we can do something a bit dodge. Basically, break that connection there and pop in Almost looks like an OR gate. An AND gate basically just set up like that to really just behave like a sort of a buffer. Uh, but what that does is that wastes a little bit of time. There'd be something like 50 or nanoseconds of propagation delay between input and output. And that might be enough. If not, we could do it again. And we've got three of them. We could even go the whole hog and do that. Sort of look, and obviously that leads back into there. So basically we come into there and into there. Okay. So let's see whether we can make that better by introducing some extra propagation delay on the oscillator output of our clock chip. So what we'll do is we'll take one of the unused AND gates, we'll tie the two inputs together, and we'll put that between the oscillator output of the clock chip and the AND gate we're using to generate this signal here. Okay, so that's what that looks like, all else being equal. Let's just adjust that delay time a bit to get our glitch back into the center of the frame. And as we can see, it hasn't exactly fixed things, but it is improved. So our duration is shorter and our peak voltage is lower. So we're now getting to maybe three volts and our duration is probably less than 200 nanoseconds now. Evidently though, that's not enough. So let's try it with two gates and see whether that gives us enough extra delay to get rid of this glitch. And the answer is almost, but not quite. Okay, let's adjust our delay again to bring our glitch into the middle or thereabouts. Okay, so I've changed the channel to be one volt per division. And as you can see, we're getting about one and a half volts of glitch there. We'd almost get away with that. Still don't like it though. Let's introduce one more gate, a bit more delay and see if we can get rid of this altogether. And that's actually done quite well. You can barely see that. Let's uh, change that to see if we can... Here we go, oh, it is there. Okay. So it's a matter of a few millivolts now. That's really nothing at all. Excellent, excellent. So as you can see, this technique does work. I'm not advocating actually doing it, but it certainly is interesting. Now. Naturally, if I was to introduce too much extra delay, we'd have problems on the other end of the square wave. So this isn't something that you can just go to town on. That said, it proves the technique does at least work. So as you've seen, this technique can actually be pretty effective. Now, I haven't gone with it. I don't fully trust the idea. And also, it's a waste of gates. I mean, I'd need extra chips to make this work. And my alternative solution with the 4017 decade counter requires just one extra chip. Now, I'd need at least two because uh, just using two extra AND gates wasn't enough. And I still got that glitch. And I believe that would have caused me problems. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, not necessarily something that I do, but it is really an, an illustration of how propagation delay can really make your life difficult. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and as always, thanks for watching.